Holly here. This is Macabish. Cults, classics, and horrors. We're talking films, series, books, and life. We're starting right now. Yeah, yeah. So for the Forest Hills, we uh, basically came with that idea from basically uh, there was a producer uh, in Michigan who I was speaking to. And unfortunately, we had a falling out because there are a lot of red flags and just the way he was uh, speaking and talking about, you know, just the, the, the difference that we had as far as ideas for another story called the forest hills which we ended up changing the story but the but the title's the same sure. so we uprooted it from uh from detroit michigan uh to new york and the catskills and i uh, decided to set it alongside a farmhouse and a cabin alongside a main character named rico who uh, initially is running naked in the woods for whatever reason and kind of unveiling the story uh from there and that's how it started my investor, Elliot, a uh, friend of mine, good friend of mine who I've known for 10 years, we worked on a couple of projects together. Uh, he decided to put the money into the project. And uh, at first it was 20,000 or so. And then uh, it kind of ballooned to 20 times that over 200,000 because we were adding names and mm-hmm. like Edward Furlong and Shelley Duvall and, you know, uh, Marion Hagen, Stacey Milk and, you know, a lot of par alum um you know as well as edward furlong so yeah so it 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 was a process and uh and he uh he was kind enough to trust in my vision and uh we made the film together yeah elliot dresnick he's a great guy that's awesome are you i I know you plan on streaming but are you gonna are you gonna have any physical copies for us fans who really really like physical copies any blu-rays any (laughs) dvds There, there have been talks of uh, VHS uh, copies oh. at some point. Okay. Yeah, I, a, a guy that uh, a guy that I know from Instagram, uh, he does like um, he does like uh, VHS and stuff. So we're thinking about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, you know, uh, the process of getting it to a streamer or wh- how, whatever direction it goes in, our process is trying to get it to a streamer because uh, mm-hmm. that would equal the biggest investment back for my uh, for my investor and myself. Sure. But um, but yeah, we're always open to Blu-ray and all different types of physical media. I think nowadays, obviously, right, we have a shift where um, and maybe it's coming back, but, you know, streaming is is, is heavily uh, a huge thing right now. And I don't sure. know, maybe, you know, I think I think there's still a demand for Blu-rays and DVDs. Oh, definitely. Um, um, yeah. And, and even VHS, you know, people want to get those VHS copies. And, and, and that's always fun, too, because, you know, even though it's even though standard definition or um, isn't isn't that great of a quality, there's still a, a nostalgia factor uh, yeah. to it nowadays, where everything's so super sharp with like 4K and potentially, you know, obviously 8K in sure. the future if that happens. So yeah, for sure, right. we would love to do that. Owning things are is, is crucial, especially you know since uh, you know you don't you don't necessarily own it when streaming. I mean, you could download it to your TV, but in like a couple of years, your TV might you know you might get a new TV and then where's the copies? You know, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. I was gonna say you're at the you're at the whim of the streamer too. If they decide they don't want to run it anymore, that's it. It's gone. That's that's right. That's it. Yeah. No, you're right. So so you know it. it, it you weigh the, the positives and the negatives, right? Like it depends mm-hmm. on also. I think like if an independent filmmaker made a film on like ten thousand dollar budget and they're like, yeah, you know what? If I make some money back, that's cool. If I don't, you know, I'll, I'll sell them on my own. You know, whatever. Um, because there's not that big of a risk, you mm-hmm. know, taken. I yeah. think more so if you're you have a risk like us trying to get money up front or a streamer and sell the film for a you know, certain term deal, like 10 years, five years, whatever, would be beneficial. So yeah, it all mm-hmm. depends. Of and uh, as, a, as a fan of horror myself, yeah, I love uh, collecting as well. So I definitely think there's, there's pros and cons for both. Yeah, I just loved watching, uh, you know, DVDs and behind the scenes stuff of like, uh, you know, Spielberg's E.T. and all these other movies, but even like being a young kid and having like a, uh, you know, like a, uh, my mom's VHS camera and, and high eight camera and like filming like family trips. I was always filming and just had that knack, you know, of, of trying to, or that love of just trying to create. And that kind of bled over into like interest is in my preteen years and teen years of like, you know, production courses and things like that. So I was, you know, thankfully I was able to get that experience and then say, wow, this is really what I want to do. So it kind of came from that. I mean, like, you know, having a VHS camera at like 10, 12 and like putting on Friday 13 part three or part four or uh, even like uh, I think what was it? A New Blood was part five or whatever, you know, or mm-hmm. Jason Takes Manhattan and like editing in camera, like filming and like stopping and then fast forwarding the, the VCR and then stopping and recording and, you know, those elements and even like 
sending the camera up on my pool side in the back and I had like an inflatable boat and I would like dress up in a hockey mask and like and like pretend like awesome. I was like killing someone on the boat, you know, with like a fake knife. Yeah, I had like all that stuff, like the fit the glow uh, meat glowing meat cleaver, you know, you could get like these novelty uh, stores and mm-hmm. stuff and like mm-hmm. the glow in the dark butcher knife and so I remember doing that and just like, you know, pretending I was Jason and like jumping into the thing and pulling people down, you know, like and I would record myself, you know. So I everyone think everyone has a story like that when they're young and they and they have like some sort of accessibility to a height camera or something like that like mark mark borchardt like the more more the scarier he did like all those like super eight or eight millimeter films you know uh that they feature on like american movie and showcase like you know you go out with your friends and you you make movies and you try to create and i think that love stems from that kind of uh thing so it depends right everyone has a different journey of how they want to make movies and what inspires them yeah like, what was the moment when you just knew, this is it, I should be doing this for a living? I guess uh, what inspired me the most was watching, like, a Steven Spielberg uh, behind the scenes of E.T. on, like, one of the, I think it was, like, 2002. There was that re-release also in theaters. So I remember going to that and just, I think they made, like, made it digital or something, or they enhanced mm-hmm. a couple of things, took out some guns and, like, re-enhanced the sky and the stars and things like that. So... Yeah, I think it was then like just seeing it and saying, man, this is so cool. I really want to like be on set and like directing. I feel like I have so much to say, you know, with 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 being able to work with people and to, um, you know, direct them and and come up with ideas. And how should the lighting be and talking to crew and like, you know, figuring out like how can we uh, effectively make the scene? And oh, you say it that way, but okay, maybe let's let's see if you kind of how, you know, now your eyes in a little bit and kind of like you know, not so much of a smirk, you know, like, so I'm very technical with directing, like, I'll, like, look at the camera and say, ah, you know what, let's, we put it a little down a little bit, let's, we stopped like a 5.6, I don't want it too much of a shallow depth of field, or, you know, um, we're going to go handheld on this one, you know, like, so there's these elements that you, that you learn, and you, and you adopt and adapt to, and then there's also things you learn, just like on the mm-hmm. forest hills, I learned a lot of stuff as well like a company move no idea what that was so i'm I'm making independent films a company move is like where you're getting all equipment and you're moving to another location so like little things like that you learn Mm -hmm. um terminologies and stuff i mean even like in college c47 was a clothespin you know uh for like hanging like up like uh uh, gels or something in front of a light you know uh Mm -hmm. that, that was the terminology for like a clothespin i think it's changed since then i mean that was like 20 years ago but you know, there's all those different things that, uh, you know, come that come together that, uh, I guess, inspire one to make movies. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So you did go to film school. Uh, I would call it more of a community college. <laughs> oh, no, that's <laughs> it's cool. Five, it's mm-hmm. called it's called Five Towns College. It's in uh, it's in uh, I remember I will tell a story about that real quick. Uh, just a little tidbit. So I had I try I wanted to try for the basketball team because at the time they had like a division three or something basketball team and I said hey I and I was talking to the coach I said I really want to be on this basketball team I really do because I was big into like Rudy and like inspired by like Sean Astin and like Rudy so I was like all about wanting to be like an NBA player so I uh so I went up to the guy his name was Heath Olsen I think and I said to him I said listen I don't know if I might be in the school I don't know and he said to me you will they just want to take your money <laughs> so <laughs> I'll never forget that and I'm like I think that's true you know and so i went to school for that i met some cool people uh we made pr- cool projects and i i was under the delusion because i think i saw a rush hour dvd and uh brett ratner had made a short film in college that mm-hmm. actually got him work i was like man my, my thesis project it's gonna get me work it didn't and i just had to do independent stuff it was either the route of being an independent filmmaker and making your own movies or traveling to New York city, which I was not inspired to do and be a PA and fetch coffee and work your way up. And I don't think there's a right or a wrong for either. Um, but you know, I think working your way up with companies is definitely important working as a PA and fetching the coffee. And a friend of mine at the time, Chris Garitano had said, he's like, you know what? He's like, I couldn't do that because, because I, I like they were making like a movie and he's like I don't want to be, be like on it you know at the end and like you know uh, hold stopping traffic and stuff you know I I want to be there making movies I want to be involved with doing it so his thing for example was storytelling and mm-hmm. I think there's a lot of people out there who want to do the same thing they want to storytell they want to tell stories and at this point we don't need permission from studios to do that now again mm-hmm. with that said I don't want to give any filmmakers or upcoming filmmakers who are listening the 
illusion that, hey, yeah, you know, make, you know, the, the, fuck the studios or like, you know, things like that. I think studios are important and I think it's a system. I think it's a game and you got to work your way into that system and game, you know, instead of, um, you know, just being all out and saying F this or F that, or I'm going to, you know, do this and stuff like that. You know, you get humbled and there's a difference between being 18 years old and being 40, right. you know? So things like that, but yeah, it's, it's a process for sure. And it's, there's no right or wrong way. You just got to keep on doing it because you love it. So it's, mm-hmm. it's like, it's like, if you make a movie, you make 20 movies and you say, I give up that 21st movie could be the movie that makes it, you know? So you, so you got to keep on, you know? So mm-hmm. yeah. is there any chance you would make a sequel to this one? And if so, what would be, what would be the thing that told you you should make a sequel? Yeah, I would make a sequel um, if it made sense based on a compelling story that could be, that doesn't water down the original, I guess, in a way. Sure. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I think I definitely would love to make a sequel if there was interest. I mean, obviously, you know, Terrifier 2, I don't know if they were planning a sequel, but obviously once it <laughs> hit millions of dollars, uh, you know, then, then mm-hmm. it was, you know, the sequel. Sure. Actually, no, we're in the, independently, right? They were both made independently, right? Like, on a, I think Terrifier yeah. 2 was 250K. And now they're making a sequel based on probably the success of Ter- Terrifier 2. So I think they're making it based on the fact that Terrifier 2 did so good. Like I said, every every film is different. Every filmmaker is different. And, mm-hmm. you know, you just got to keep on pushing, you know? Right. Yeah. So when do you think we'll get to see this movie? Uh, April 30th at the, <laughs> the uh, Salem Horror Fest. No, uh, yeah. All, you know, I mean, we got some festivals. We're lining, we're lining up and stuff that we'll announce. Um, but uh, yeah, we're gonna continue to push it, and uh, hopefully within the next eight, ten months, I would imagine. I don't know. It takes time to secure a deal with a streamer and mm. all that stuff. And if we don't secure a deal, then we're gonna potentially think about self-distributing. So I mean, sure. or selling to a distributor. So it all it really depends, you know. Okay. Really, yeah, on how it goes. Yeah, that's okay. fair. That's fair. Yeah, I think also people don't realize that just because the movie is done and it's gone to festival that it doesn't just come out it's not just available exactly yeah so it's it's all a process and you know just trying to figure out the best avenue for uh the project that you're currently doing for sure yeah i think you definitely have some uh some benefit behind you because you do have some very recognizable names in the the horror genre as as roles in the movie and what astounds me most is the fact that you have Shelley Duvall. Like this is the first thing she's done in two decades. How yeah. how did that come about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I mean, yeah, that was interesting. I found her. I found uh, contact information of someone uh, that she knows online, and I reached out, and uh, they gave me her number, and I pitched it to her, and it kind of took a lot of persuasion to kind of get her involved, and. We said, okay, we're going to be there and uh, be in, in this area and let's uh, get this shot and let's get you in there. And we did it. And she was originally just going to be kind of like a Pamela Voorhees type of, you know, voice inside the main character Rico's head. But we decided that she said what she said, hey, I would love to act with someone, you know, that's what I really would love. So we set up like two more or three more different shoots on different days and brought different cast members out and yeah, filmed with her. And she was sweet, you know, um, you know, people ask me all the time to send me emails and say, oh, how can I get in touch with Shelly Duvall? And I, you know, unfortunately, she's dealing with some personal issues as far as health, yeah. not not mental mm-hmm. stuff, but just like health stuff that I think, you know, is, you know, for right now, I think it's best she focuses on herself at this point. But um, right. But no, That's I'm, why we were so excited to see her. Can't yeah. believe it. Yeah, no, she's no, she was great. She was fun to work with. And uh, my crew, Digital Thunderdome Productions, went down to Texas and bunch of the cast and crew and and they filmed her and uh I remote directly remoted her over the phone because at that time i couldn't leave new york and uh did family obligations and stuff and yeah so uh but yeah we're we're excited about it i think she did a great job so uh so once everyone sees i think they'll be very uh pleasantly surprised and happy with her role and mm. it's not just like a little small like 30 second thing it's like a, at least a couple minutes four or five minutes so you know it's nothing crazy but at the same time we had the time we had with her and that's all we had so yeah. uh and yeah we you know um, when someone when someone struggles with like mental health for example over you know uh, you know like on dr phil or whatever the case she's very sharp she is very sharp very sweet um but uh you know sometimes you know the mental health still is is, is a big issue for some a lot of people 
Right. I'm not saying for in general, or general, but just in general, like it's hard sometimes, you know, like right. when, you, you know, when, when you're dealing with something, whether it's physical or mental or anything and, and mental health, I think was very important to talk about the forest hills because there's a lot of aspects of mental health and how the people that we're around and how people are, people are, you know, jerks because they can, you know, persuade someone who's un- mentally unwell, like a character in a film persuades another character. Um, and yeah. And so we just wanted to show the cruelty of that as well. Um, right. And a lot of the, the issues that, that go with that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. That's what I thought when I saw the little trailer is that, that I thought it had something to do with mental health. This actually yeah. is a great idea for a werewolf movie. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yeah, we tried, we wanted to do something different with the world film too. Like we didn't want to create the same old, you know, stereotypical man gets bitten, turns at the moon. You know, like that's been right. like, like so 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 done so many times. Um, and world movies could be kind of cheesy if they're on a low budget and stuff. And but you know, like I mean, if you try to strive to be inspired and 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 no limitations of budget, right? And work with what you have, um, and not you know, try to copy. And I think there's some great, like, you know, independent werewolf, like, uh, transformations that are pretty, that are pretty cool. You can tell they're low budget. It's Mm -hmm. cool to see the love and and, and affection behind creating those uh, transformations and things like that. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but uh, with this film, we wanted to kind of use the werewolf uh, situation as a backstory to a bigger issue, which was mental health. So, uh, so yeah, we tried to just do something completely different, but also include that whole werewolf aspect to it. Yeah. Whoever made your trailer, did a great job of putting that point across because I didn't even watch the whole trailer. Like I was just a you know little bit in before I realized it was going to be about mental health. But I think that's brilliant. Cool, very cool. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think mental health is a big thing nowadays, and and it's a lot of people struggle whether it's financial, whether it's you know uh, issues with that's going on with life or family or whatever. And I think a lot of people can relate to the human aspect of you know. Um, what what uh what these characters uh deal with and the, and the dysfunction of family as well you know there's a lot of that in the film and will there be like one really good transformation <laughs> sequence because you know people want that we definitely were inspired by uh american wealth in london um and with the budget we had we uh decided to get some prosthetics that were not cgi and utilize those in uh one of the sequences um, with Edward Furlong and the actor Chico Mendes who played Rico. So, uh, yeah, you'll see Eddie uh, Furlong transforming sort of to a werewolf in the next couple of years or whatever, whenever it comes out. <laughs> so, That's but, uh, awesome. Yeah, yeah no, there's a lot of firsts for sure, yeah. Um, you know, Shelly taking, Shelly doing like a small role, but, tw- you know, 20 years later after retiring, mm-hmm. I'm sure it happens. The fact you know, that going- it's going to be more than a cameo is like a miracle. Yeah, no, uh, no, no. Yeah. It, originally it was like originally it was going to be like a, you know, 30, 45 second, like Pamela Voorhees style, you know, type of character. But then we kind of, you know, we we knew that the fans wanted more. So we right. had mm-hmm. a bunch more, bunch more scenes as well. So it was about uh, three scenes with her and then some cameo flashbacks st- and then some, sorry, flashback stuff. Um, mm-hmm. But thankfully, uh, Felissa Rose from Sleepaway Camp came out and did a scene with her. And, we're, you know, I'm a big fan of hers. So um yeah she she uh she was very thankful for that as well she she was great with uh, shelly and they did an amazing job together for sure so once you see it you'll see yeah she uh she did a great job that's yeah. awesome d wallace i just want to know since i don't get to see it i just want to <laughs> know what we're getting here d wallace shot for a couple hours and it's all the same location because it's scattered throughout the film mm-hmm. so uh then a bunch of different scenes yeah but oh, she's good. not like she's not like a main main character but you know she's definitely like a cameo type but uh but definitely uh, brings her A game to it. I mean, it's a lot of intense stuff for sure. So yeah, so excited! I can't get enough of werewolf movies, and especially solid werewolf movies that bring something new to the to that subgenre and to the level that it should be at. And I I really feel like you're definitely going to bring us to a new level. Cool. Yeah, we appreciate that. Yeah, no, it's you know I'm a big horror fan like you guys, and we're just trying to you know create something. Uh, create something special here and yeah we think we did but you know it, it's so funny right like we you you know we we always have expectations of movies right and it's so interesting like seeing the reviews once it's released right and just seeing like how people react to it like for example we had a screening at Smodcastle Cinema's Kevin Smith Theater 
in New Jersey um, recently, and there was a scene that I didn't think people would laugh at. I mean, you know, was, there's just a very important dialogue that happens after there's like a, I was called the peanut butter scene, and people, there was a one shot that happens after in slow motion of Rico, one of the characters, Rico, dancing in slow motion with like a peanut butter jar and a knife. And the whole audience burst out laughing. And I didn't even, I wasn't intended to be like that, <laughs> which is funny. But it's just interesting seeing, like, seeing the intensity of the film um, and then seeing the relief and the laughter. Because I think people watch something that's very intense for a long time and they're mm-hmm. you know, captivated by the story. And all of a sudden, when something happens, one person, if they start laughing, everyone starts laughing. Or it's a collective thing. So I think movies are meant to be seen in the theater for sure, you know, so places like Salem Horror Fest and other places and, you know, distribution, when you get distributed into the theater, it's meant to be a shared experience. And I think we lost that out during uh, COVID when things had shut down for sure. You know, there were, there was some great stuff that was made. I think what in 2000, I think it was 2000, maybe it was 2000 or 2002 ginger snaps was different. Oh yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, that was pretty cool. Um, you know, uh, and, and then, uh, I think dog soldiers was pretty big. I didn't see mm-hmm. it, but I know that was one that people liked yeah. a lot. Oh yeah. Uh, um, and then, uh, Obviously, you have like American Wolf in London from like, you know, when that was made and uh, the howling of obviously mm-hmm. uh, another one. I'd say I'd say the American Wolf in London is probably the best world transformation of all time, I'd say. In my opinion, you know, I right. love, love transformation for sure. Over the howling, for sure. In my opinion. But yeah. Well, do, do you see like the time period you had to span for the werewolf yeah. movies? That's a long time. That's not very many <laughs> werewolf movies. Yeah, I think maybe that it could show potentially that there's maybe not enough interest on a mainstream level, but uh, maybe not more on an independent level. So, I mean, yeah, it depends. I mean, look, you need to, you just need one werewolf movie or one movie that has werewolves in it to completely become like a Terrifier 2 and be successful mm-hmm. in order now then for 50,000, 50, no, not 50,000, but like 50, at least 25 to 50 other now films that are going to be werewolves because it's hot. It's hot, right. it's hot, it's hot. You know, it's, it's, it's something that people want to see. Let's see more, let's see more. So I think couple of slashers after the fact but i think i think i know what you did last summer was one of them potentially that was probably from scream uh you know and there was a lot of like influence of scream too like at halloween h2o you know you had like kevin williamson uh not kevin williamson's score you had the score of from scream there were some like cues from scream that were in there you know it's it's interesting also seeing like themes and how they kind of you know are in one film and then Mm -hmm. kind of might show up in another you know but you're right it only takes one and yours might be that one and suddenly we get flooded with werewolf <laughs> movies that'd be great there you go <laughs> i would i would love that that'd be great for sure yeah yeah, yeah that would It'd be fantastic what's next after this oh yeah so yeah so what's next is i have a bunch of pitch decks and scripts um and you know it depends on you know if people want to fund them and hopefully they do and you just gotta just gotta get the film out there and then we'll see how it goes but i have a vampire serial killer film i have a uh, underground bunker end of the world project similar to day of the dead Mm. The original one, not mm. the not the shitty remakes, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, what else? And then uh, one called Montauk, which is about like uh, quarter sort of a story about like um, mind control and Camp Hero and the Montauk Project, but talk in a different story told in a different about a mother and son and uh, them fleeing from a, an abusive relationship. So there's a bunch of different stuff out there for sure. Yeah, so okay. we'll see. Where can uh, where can our where can we find your books and where can we find uh, other things that you may have been involved in? Yeah, uh, I'm on IMDb uh, under Scott Goldberg, um, and the Far Hills show up under there. Um, Instagram, uh, so I think it's Scott Goldberg official is my uh, username mm-hmm. on there. Uh, I type my my name on there, and then also uh, on Amazon, if you type in the Scott Goldberg, so that's uh, where people can find me. Thank you for having me on the, the interview, and I appreciate it. And, uh, Great, yeah, I'm on a train, so hopefully, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad it went well. So, yeah, me too. Tag us when the movie comes out because we want to see it. Will do. Thank you so much, guys. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is the number one place for macabre cults, classics, and horrors. For synopsis, reviews, and news, go to macabre.com. Thank you for listening. Signing out. Until the next one.